my very good friend, Dr. Rotarian Emmanuel Katongore, is a great man. He is great because he has, uh, throughout his adult life, chosen to serve humanity. Two weeks ago, I was at an airport in Africa at Bole in Addis Ababa in Ethiopia, and an old man approached me and told me the tragedy of Africa is that we rhapsodize our men and women when they are dead and vilify them in life. Yet wisdom demands that we lionize men and women who have done good when they are alive. Today we choose to lionize you when you are alive. I've had the advantage of listening uh, to the speakers who came before me and I could very well say that when I listen to the passion and erudition of Dr. P.K., he spoke for me. When he defined what leadership is all about, he spoke for me, and I could very well sit down, but I will not sit down. When I listened to the intelligent and at once beautiful lady, Madame Fall, from Senegal, she spoke for me. And I could very well sit down, but I will not sit down. I also had the almost apocalyptic and doomsday scenario painted by Edger. <laughs> and for those of you who are digital, you must have assumed for one moment uh, that your life is at an end. I can assure you that there is life beyond Ed Jack. <laughs> but there is a sense in which he defined what the world is about. I then had the advantage of listening to the panel discussion. Anil, my friend whom we are in the business of meeting after every 12 months, spoke about what leadership is all about. And he spoke about leadership and what leadership does. I listened to Emmanuel from Zimbabwe and the many things that he has done over the years and how he has been able to identify that leadership is about service. And I did not stop there. I listened to the incoming district governor, Rosetti, explaining to us what Rotary does and how it utilizes our funds for the general good. And perhaps leadership is service, is when you serve that you lead. And perhaps over the years we have misunderstood what leadership is all about. Then we had the occasion of listening to Dr. Diana, whom I've had the opportunity of meeting before this day giving personal testimonies of what defines our continent of Africa in matters as mundane as the lack of blood at critical moments. 
And then, of course, we had the motivation from Dr. Emmanuel Katongole and how this idea came all the way from the Deputy Prime Minister of the Kingdom of the Buganda, which gave meaning to the whole idea that when we talk about leadership, it's about learning. We are here, therefore, this evening sacrificing our time and our money that we may lead through service. Many times in the last few years, I've had the advantage of traveling to many African countries. And one sees how Africa lacks in the most basic of things. Sometimes, if one is a pessimist, one is likely to surrender and to leave it to God. But God, in his divine wisdom, also enabled us with wisdom. And that is why we are assembled here today because in a way, we are celebrating the wisdom of men and women who have chosen to dedicate their lives to make a contribution in a chosen area of service, the area of providing blood to those who are in distress. You know, when you are alive and well, and healthy and hearty, and imbibing wine and water and other beverages, it never occurs to you that you may need blood. I'm not being morbid, but it happens in the twinkling of an eye that you are driving home and some irresponsible individual maneuvers his car or border border or any other moving object. And lo and behold, you need blood. Then it is discovered that you can't find blood. That is when you begin to appreciate that initiatives such as these are life-defining. So when we are gathered in an assembly such as this, what are the critical questions that must invade our minds and hearts? When I listened to Aja, and he spoke passionately, and he told us how technology has now dramatically changed our lives, and I can't agree with you more, Aja, that indeed it has. I remember so very vividly as a young man when we had a company called Eastman Kodak. And many of you will remember the occasions when some amateur photographer in your school wanted to immortalize your borrowed suits and dresses through a photograph. And you had to pose for your photograph to be taken. And two weeks later, the individual would come and say that the photograph burnt. <laughs> so it was not there after all. <laughs> Eastman Kodak is now out of the equation because of technology. Your mobile phone, when we talk about technology and artificial intelligence, your phone, you yourself today, is a part of artificial intelligence 
Because many of us, without the mobile phone, as they just said, we can't function. That is how it is. But the other truth is also, and permit me to say this, there are doctors here, Africa presents in a very schizophrenic way. Schizophrenia is a psychiatric condition of multiple personalities. There is an Africa which uses the smartphone, but there is another Africa which does not know about the smartphone. But the tragedy is that even if it does not know, it is affected by it. Ugandans are now beginning to learn Kiswahili. In Kiswahili they say, Mtego wapanya uingia waliomo na wasio kuemo. And the English rendition, if I may transliterate rather than translate, is this. Is that a mouse trap traps Every mouse, regardless of the one that ate whatever it was. Every mosquito suffers, even if it is not the one that actually invaded you. Because they suffer in the community of mosquitoes. So all of us, in a sense, are victimized by these realities. As I grow older, and I'm growing older by the day, I ask myself very fundamental questions, particularly we as Africans. In other parts of the world, the question of the availability of blood, if you are in Sweden or in Denmark or in Singapore, or oh, in no way, perhaps it would be different. But in the African continent, the reality is that we are saddled with many things that stand in our way of solving these very mundane problems. I was gladdened when Dr. Diana said that they had an agreement with the kingdom of Busoga. It is true in very many African societies that you would be told that you cannot allow your blood to mix with anybody's blood. So you need to engage those who are in that space to persuade those over whom they have influence and authority to know that donation of blood is a good thing. And that you don't have to be rich to donate blood. You only have to be healthy and you only have to have a heart that is giving. You only have to define what it is that you want to contribute to your society. That is why we are gathered here today. Just this morning, I was rereading a book that I had read several years before. It's a book that was written in the 5th century BC by a Chinese called Sun Tzu. And in that book he says, among other things, that deep knowledge is about being aware of disturbance before the disturbance comes. It is about being aware of danger before danger comes. It is about being aware of calamity before calamity comes. Because when you are aware of disturbance before it comes, you can convert it into peace. When you are aware of danger before it comes, you can turn it into order 
And when you are aware of calamity before it comes, you can convert it into something positive. That is how I understand the initiative of Dr. Emmanuel Katongole. He is aware of the danger before it comes. He is aware of the calamity before it comes. And that is what changes society. And that is what defines what leadership is all about. You know, many of you here are either practicing Christians or practicing Hindus or practicing Muslims. And whether you read the Muslim Quran or the Christian Bible or the Hindu Gita or the Jewish Torah, those who lead their fellow men and women to greatness are initially very reluctant, but once they have made the decision, they are amazingly passionate. The Muslims who are here, and I believe they are, will remember that confrontation between the Prophet Muhammad and the angel Jibril in the caves. When he is told, read in Arabic, Ikra, and he says, I cannot read, then he reads, and the world has never been the same again once he started reading. And the moral of that story is that when you start serving, you can never stop serving. And those of you who are Christians, will remember that day when the Son of Man at the wedding in Cana is asked by the mother that the wine has run out and he is reluctant. And then he is persuaded to convert water into wine. And from that day, wine has always been flowing. <laughs> and those of you who are Hindus, I assume there are some here, in that battle of Kurukshetra, in the conversation between Arjun and Krishna, when he doubts that he should start the war, immediately he is persuaded the war continues and truth triumphs over good. I'm persuading us in this assembly that we have come here for the purpose of donating to a good cause. If you have any money in your pocket, the wisdom of the occasion not only requires, but demand that you empty your pockets in this assembly. <laughs> because you will be doing it for a good cause. And when I was thinking about this, because as you grow older, you become a little more introspective, you cease to be prescriptive, and you ask certain fundamentals, and you go back to history. And I remembered reading about a young man who died at the age of 32 in the month of June in the year 323 BC, Alexander the Great. And history records that on the day that he was dying, he gave the following, instruc following instructions to his generals, that when he dies, it is only his physicians that should carry his mortal remains. Number two, that all the wealth that he had gathered should be strewn on the path where his body would be taken as he's being taken to be interred. And number three, that he should be buried with his hands wide open. And the generals asked him, why do you give us such strange instructions? And he told them, of my physicians that it may be known that when death comes, even the best of physicians cannot protect you. Of the second instruction, 
that the world may know that this wealth that we gather in the world, when we die, it means nothing. And of the third instruction to tell the world that into the world he came empty-handed and out of the world he goes empty-handed. And that the moral of this story, that the only thing that we must do is to ensure that we use all that we have in our lifetime to do that which is good for humanity. Today I'm asking and beseeching all of us who are present in this assembly to take counsel from those immortal words and instructions of Alexander the Great. There is wisdom in giving. But remember, I listened to several speeches before I was invited to speak. I also listened to Dr. Barton, a Canadian born in Mengo, Uganda in 1962. He is away outside of Uganda. But he has not severed the umbilical cord between him and Uganda. So that when he was sought and found by Dr. Emmanuel Katongole, he was able to remember that he was here in Uganda. And by that reason only, he has made a contribution to this cause. If one such as that, who is not aboriginally Ugandan or aboriginally African can make such a contribution, why should you not make a contribution this evening? You know, we are talking about 100,000 United States dollars. For some of us, we need a lottery to win 100,000 United States dollars. But I'm acutely aware that in this assembly, there is Stanbeck, which was founded several years ago. Stanbeck, I'm aware that you've made contributions before, but wisdom not only requires but demand that you improve your contribution. I beseech you, O oh Stanbeck. I am also aware that there is an organization called ABSA with which I bank. Until very recently, it was Barclays. Oh, ABSA. Having turned from blue to red, let us be demonstrate, let it be demonstrated to us how red you are. If only in this assembly you could come out and say, 100,000 United States dollars, what is that? That is pocket change. Emmanuel Katongole and your team behold 100,000. Your profits would grow exponentially. If only exponentially is a word that was used generously by Asia. MTN. Oh, you who, when we sit here under our tables, you are earning your money because you are sending SMSs and WhatsApp and all that other thing. Oh, MTN. If you could do that which you must, we would not be here for another minute. We are only here to wait for you to tell us that 100,000 United States dollars is nothing. Sipla, we know about your 350,000 United States dollars. We know you are Mickey Mouse when we compare you to Absa. And we compare you to Granton and Thornton, which is present in 100 and 35 countries. Anil, if for every country in which you are present, you donate 1,000 United States dollars this evening, we would have 135 
United States dollars. When I talk about all these, I'm talking about our ability to serve. Rotary is a great organization. Many attempts have been made to convert me into a Rotarian. And many an attempt has failed because of my own lethargy. I was made a honorary member. I could not attend enough meetings. And for that reason, I did not become a real member. This year, I will endeavor to be a chartered member of the Rotary Club. Because the spirit of Rotary is a spirit of service. I want you, Madame Fall, in her own inimitable way, ask you to pause for one minute and to search your hearts and to ask yourselves what your values are. Permit me to be morbid to ask you for half a second to pause and ask yourself if the Almighty were to call you now, God forbid, what would you say that you have done to humanity? Just for a minute. How would we eulogize you Would you simply say that you are born on the 28th of some month of some year and that you lived and that you died and that the only two certificates you have are the birth and the death? <laughs> or that in between those certificates you have changed the lives of others? Dr. P.K., I hope you are still in the assembly. I heard you so very eloquently when you said that leadership is about changing and influencing others. How many of you changed? Dr. Katongole, when he had the floor, introduced young men and women and said, these are the young men and women who will take over. I remember in 1978, I read a book written in 1958 by a young Nigerian called Chinua Achebe. And in one of the pages he asks, where are the young men and women, where are the young suckers that will grow when the old bananas die? These are old bananas. They are dying. We saw the young suckers here, which tells us that leadership is like a relay race, intergenerational. One generation running with the baton and passing over the baton to the other generation. If only we could emulate the waves in the sea. Just as the new waves come, they renew the old waves, and lo and behold, the ocean remains alive and well. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a happy occasion. It is a happy occasion because we have come here to remind ourselves that when all is said and done, perhaps service is the only thing that defines us. Dr. P.K., you said it so very eloquently and very passionately that when the chips are down, we'll ask not how many cars you drove, 
will ask not whether you are wearing designer suits from Giorgio or Armani. We'll ask not which perfume you wore from Bulgari. We'll ask whom did you serve and which lives did you change. That is what leadership is all about. And that is how I understand Mother Teresa of Calcutta, who when she was asked, what is your claim to greatness? And she said, if I'm great at all, my only claim to greatness is that when I entered into a dark room, I wondered not why it was dark, but I lit a candle that it may contribute to destroying the darkness. Today, I'm asking you to take personal responsibility. If we live in darkness, light your candle. And in your own space, lo and behold, there will be light. I also remember those immortal words of the great American Ralph Waldo Emerson, who when asked, how can we make the world clean? He said, lo and behold, the world can be clean if every man and woman were to swim, sweep his front yard. Today I'm asking you, ask not why the world is not clean. Sweep your front yard and ask your neighbor to sweep their front yard and lo and behold, the world will be clean. We are talking about blood. We can save lives. You can save lives. So today I ask you to make a solemn vow. A solemn vow, like Emmanuel from Zimbabwe has made a solemn vow that every four months he eats well as he should and he donates blood. I can assure you that when you donate blood, blood will regenerate and you will be happier because you saved a life. So go out there into the world and do not philosophize about leadership. Do not moralize about leadership. Do not intellectualize about leadership because leadership philosophize is not leadership. Leadership moralized is not leadership. Leadership intellectualized is not leadership. Leadership that is acted, leadership that is defined by service, that is leadership. So go out there and serve. God bless you.